to you today. We are humbled by your presence, Lord. We're humbled by your goodness and your love for us. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that you have given us so much. You've given us life and life abundantly. So, Father, you meet all our needs in our body, soul, and spirit today. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Michael and the rest of the team. It's all good. <laughs> good to be here. Thanks for coming. A little uh, feedback coming there at Rocky. A little bit. Thank you, brother. Amen. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. Got some friends here today. Bless you guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I've been really blessed by reading. I don't know if anybody was here during the conference we had with Peter Nash. How many were here for that Peter Nash conference? I've been reading his book and I've been every morning, I kind of read it out loud between Joy and I, uh, out of Manifesting Heaven. And I thought, wow. He's got such a great insight into the power of bringing forth heaven on earth. It's here, all for us. We just have to step out and walk in that. And you know what? I've, I've challenged you before about having your imagination exercise and, and seeing and imagining what God is like, imagining what it's all about, what his presence is about. And you know, as we do that, we will press into the realms that we've never maybe walked into. And, uh, you know, because sometimes our thoughts, we obviously want to go down some other path, whether it's lust, sin of some kind. Our mind naturally goes that way. This is one of the things, right? And so we need to take authority over that and walk in the Spirit, walk in His light, and see and start imagining, imagining, imagining. That's where all creativity comes from. All things are coming from incredible things. And, and people are going through, I know there's, People going through a lot in their lives, whether, whether it be health, whether it be finances, whether it be relationships, whatever it may be. But the more that we start bringing forth his love, and his, as we start seeking it, and as we start seeing it, and as the word of God becomes life in our bodies, the more your problems start to kind of drift away. Start to go, oh yeah, like he is so good that he will perform He'll go to the end of the earth for you. He already has. So, just that's a little... That's free. There's no charge for that. I want to talk about today, fear. If you're to do an acronym of fear, F means false. E means evidence. A means appearing. And R means real. False evidence appearing real. F-E-A-R. Keep that in your mind. Because fear is a diabolical weapon the enemy keeps so many people absolutely in, trapped in. That we walk in that. We, we start to say, you have no understanding, brother. You, you know, all these things are going on in my life. We're so fearful. I'm... So you're grabbing hold of that which is not even real. I know when we wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, what about this, what about that? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, whatever it may be. Remember, God did not give us what? The spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? So fear has no grip over it. You take, over, take authority over that and say, spirit? I know who you are. You're a two-bit demon. Get out of my life in the name of Jesus. You can deliver yourself. You have the right, you have the power to do that in the name of Jesus. If you don't feel that you have enough of that weaponry, artillery to do that, come and see me. I can tell you I'm living proof of being delivered from fear. Not that I was spirit of fear. Not because I was fearful, but I was born with it. Um, you know, I was born with the spirit of fear. And I'll give a long story, and I think I've shared this before. But it manifested itself 
into, come on in, brothers. <laughs> we come all the way from Vancouver. But it manifested itself in me in horrible allergies, food allergies, and everything else. I was down to six foods when I got married. And uh, I went for prayer at our um, fellowship I was at at the time. And there was a fellow there speaking on the spiritual roots of disease. You know that there's a spiritual root to disease. And he said that all allergies come from the spirit of fear. And I thought, well, I'm not sure if this could be an allergy. I mean, whatever. So I got went up, got prayed for. The next morning I got up and I ate everything I shouldn't have eaten. And nothing happened. I was instantly delivered. I didn't, it didn't, I mean, I'm not saying that if you do have a spirit, or if you have allergies, I'm not saying it might happen that quickly. It did for me. So it, I'm living evidence that you can be delivered from, from the spirit of fear. And <clears throat> I wanted to go into something here about, you know that they've got, they labeled, they've labeled phobias. I, I just want to read some of these, these labels they have for phobias, which are absolutely crazy. How about hepta? This heptadecaphobia is the fear of the number 17. Heptadecaphobia is considered, considered to be the ill-fated ill in Italy and other countries of Greek and Latin origins. While the date Friday the 17th is considered especially unfortunate in Italy, the number is, is feared due to superstition and is similar in nature to the fear of the number 13 in anglo saxon we know about that. Driving phobia. How many have had driving phobia? Driving anxiety. Zehophobia. Uh, Amaxophobia, or driving related fear, is a pathological fear of driving. It is an intense, persistent fear of participating in car traffic that affects a person's lifestyle, including aspects such as an inability to participate in certain jobs due to the pathological avoidance of driving. See? He's a two-bit demon. He's just a demon. Get out of here! In the name of Jesus. The fear of driving may be triggered by specific driving situations such as expressway driving or dance traffic. And then buses. Okay, how about chromophobia? <laughs> it, it is a persistent, irrational fear of or aversion to colors. And is usually a conditioned response. While actually clinical phobias to color are rare, Colors can elicit, elicit hormonal responses and psychological reactions. Chromophobia may also refer to an aversion of use of color in products of design. Within cellular biology, chromophobic cells are a classification of cells that do not attract hemotoxylin as related to chromatolosis. These are really big terms. This is, goes on and on and on. Tetrophobia, truschetiophobia, that's the fear of number 13. Uh, uh, pyrophobia, <laughs> I like this one. A pyrophobia is a phobia of infinite or eternity, or infinite, infinity or eternity, causing discomfort and somewhat panic attacks. I'm afraid of eternity. Ah! If you got Jesus in you, you've already had eternity living in you. It normally starts in adolescence or earlier and is currently known. Um, how it normally develops over time. Uh, Apereophobia may be caused by existential dread about eternal life or eternal oblivion following death. Due to this, it is often connected with anatophobia. Uh, I could go on about all this. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Just how those things are related to the spiritual. Simple. Okay. So how many want the church to grow today? I mean, you know, I, I don't mean as in numbers, but I want to, I'm talking about that Jesus is, you know, filling the society with his presence. How many are into that, right? Yes. We'd like to have our church full of people here too, but that's, that's going to come. But when we, when we preach Jesus, he's going to show up, right? But I'm going to read a scripture to you, and this is, you want to talk about a formula. Here's a formula for church growth. Acts 9.31.
Then the church is throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. So I would say that that's quite a big area at that time, would have been. Had peace and were edified. So they had some things going on. And walking in the fear of the Lord. Come, say with me, fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, okay? And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Okay? So the church grew because of some things. They had perfect that peace. They were edified. But they, the most important thing in here is the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit in which they were multiplied. Now, we talk about the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is not fearful like, oh, no. It is and it isn't. It's a, an absolute reverence. An absolute reverence for the Almighty, for Him who created everything. If you were standing, if He came into this room right now, He's here. But if He physically showed up in the room here, what would you do? We would be pretty. <laughs> I think that we would be pretty and awestruck by the pre His presence, the God who created everything. Okay. would be absolutely amazing. Now, have we become so, quote, friendly with our God that he is just one of us? As in, yeah, hey God, <laughs> nice to see you, Jesus. Or do we, have we somehow lost a reverence for him? Have we somehow managed to delegate, relegate him to something different than he is? There was a song a few years ago by Joan Osborne. It says, you know, What if God were one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Is that really edifying? Was he a slob? No. But you know, I, I have to say this. He's not a slob, and of course neither are we. But through what, what's happened in our minds, natural minds is that we put God off into something else, into a little compartmental thing over here. Well, it's, it's a God who's over here somewhere. Blah, 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 blah. But he's everywhere, first of all. Let's get that straight. And he is also in us. He's in our DNA. He's in the presence of us. Everywhere. That's what we first have to establish. Secondly, we have to establish that unfortunately in society today, through the teaching of evolution, this is my I'm going to get really jump on this whole thing. And people say, what's wrong with the teaching of evolution? Everything. It's a lie, number one. Because if you take a look at it, it takes such great faith to believe in what they actually have to say about where we came from. That you <laughs> forget it. They'll, they'll spend $10 trillion, bazillion dollars trying to find out the origins of life and how we got here, blah, 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 blah. But the main thing is the subtlety of it, what they've done through the teaching of evolution, is that they've given you, or humanity, they've relegated us to a nothing. That we just came by some spark, some primordial soup, and somehow it changed and it evolved into the next critter, and then that somehow decided it was going to do that, and blah, 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 and you know, you know the drill. And then we kind of moved up. And then we're on this spinning globe, a thousand miles an hour, rushing through space. And there's, you know, this hopelessness. We're just nothing. We're one of 10 bazillion, and how many times you think? Oh, no, there's 10 bazillion, zillion, zillion, unlimited number of galaxies. And we're in this solar system. That there's, we're nothing. We're just a nothing. So what does that make you feel like? ultimately, is what? A nothing, right? You don't really have, you know, you're, you're pointless, your life is really not going to go anywhere. You go through life, you, you're you going to procreate children and all kind of stuff. You get a job. But in the ultimate uh, language of today's world is that we don't really have a whole lot going for us. And that's what we're experiencing now with the um, you know, the World Economic Forum and all these people, transhumanism, they're trying to change us into something better, they're trying to make us something different because 
They don't like who we are. How many like who you are today? How many love who you are today? Amen. Yes. You are not a speck flying through some unexplainable black margins of going through there. You are here today created in the image of God who made you like him. And he wants you to have the best of everything. But brother, I don't have the best of everything. You do. You've got him. You've already won the lottery, folks. He is in you. But the God of the universe is in you today, right? Anyway, that's off what it that's off. Again, that's pretty much sharp. So <laughs> So when we look at life through that, I think one of the things that we have to realize that um, in, in our society, there used to be um, a reverence for people who were in power. There used to be a reverence for people. I mean, if the King of England walked in here today, would we say, hey, Chuck? Right? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? There's no, I mean, as bad as our leadership in the government is, there is no reverence. And I mean, I know that they maybe say, well, they don't deserve it. But the value of the leadership of something today, and the terms, especially when we come to, to you know, um, people who are over top of us, we, we uh, acknowledge them, we give them they're right. We, we revere them, not because they're great and everything else, but they do have a position. But because we've made fun of them, and because we've, we've denigrated them, and again, I, I'm not speaking here to say I'm on the side of anybody. I'm just saying that the position that they hold, the office they hold, is a reverential office they hold. Right? So it may be your boss. You may hate his guts. But his office that he holds, what he may be, is, has a reverential position, right? So I'm just saying that we've been denigrated down to such levels of irreverential things that God somehow has been thrown into that pot, I think. That the Lord God Almighty himself has been, oh yeah, God, you're all right, you know. We're just going to go on. You're my buddy. <laughs> We're walking down the street together. He has that relationship with us. But there is a reverence that we need to get back to. Walking in the fear, reverence, awe of the Lord. Right? They walked in the fear of the Lord. There was a reverence. I mean, I've been, to, how many people have been to southern states like Texas? How many been down there? Anybody? Texas is particularly really kind of cool because when you talk to somebody down there, they revere you as man. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. And that's not because I'm older. It's just because they have a reverence for you. They have, they, they elevate you. It's in their part of their culture. Maybe they don't really mean to do it. But they say, yes, sir. But there is, a, a, there is something that we need to get back into that, is to have a reverence for the God, for the God Almighty of our creator of the universe, right? So what does Proverbs 1, verse 7 have to say? Probably people all know this already. So the fear... Reverence, awesomeness of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay? So go back to uh, verse 1 in that chapter 2, brother. Can you do that? Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Okay, so it says, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, keep going, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, 
to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddle. That's what the fear of the Lord gives us, are those things, in order to be able to, if you want to know things, if you want to have, I mean, people say, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand scripture. I don't have a concept of things. I can't understand these things. Well, maybe we go back to the beginning and say, Lord, I humble myself before you. I have tremendous fear because you made me. I have tremendous reverence for the God that created everything. I love you, Lord. That's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments. To love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, right? That's the first commandment. And Jesus came along and said, oh, I'll give you even a greater commandment. Is to what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And to love your enemies. I can't love my enemies. They got guns shooting at me. Point. Love on them. It doesn't matter with your body because we're in, because of our immortal nature, our bodies say we want to preserve ourselves. We want to preserve this as much as we can. But God says, die. You know, through scripture, you talk about die to self and everything else. Don't worry about tomorrow today. Because today's life will take care of itself. Um, Proverbs 2, 1 to 5, brother. Okay, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. So you have to do what? Seek. Seek knowledge. Seek these things. Seek him like they were the most treasured treasure you could ever, ever have. The most expensive treasure. Right? We sometimes want to seek for gold in the, go out to the gold mine and start digging through and finding out if there's any gold in them there are hills, right? But we, we're not going to do that simply because it's impossible um, to go out there. I'm just thinking but it's not practical for us because he has provided for us, for us in, in every way. And that's another thing we should do here. This is something that I really, we worship him in awe and wonder and not as some sugar daddy or some other entity. Job was asked several times about creation which he could answer or not. And I think we should be challenged the same. Because he was asked, the question says, where were you when I created the snow? And where were you when I these different things happened on? So I'm going to challenge you today. Here's the challenge. Where were you when God caused the oceans to rise and fall? Think about that. Where were you? Where were you when the first sunrise graced the earth with a light that still shines today after many millennia? Where were you? Were you there? No, you weren't there. Right? You might have been in the spirit realm, because he knew us before <laughs> the foundation of the world. Where were you in the first, uh, when the prayers of healing were carried over some telephone lines to knit some broken bones together? Were you there? or to heal some festering sore, or to deliver somebody from something. Were you there? Where, where, where are you in all this, right? I'm not trying to, I'm just saying that this is the power that we were dealing with. Our minds cannot begin to fathom the vastness of this God and the abundance
abundance of his goodness. Romans 8, 38. Please. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor nothing's presence, nor nothing's to come, nothing to come, anything more, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all those things that we talked about are, you can't possibly, God, is, he loves us so much, you can't possibly fathom his faith. But we do by faith accept the power that he's given us, accept all the love he's given us. But fear will ex prohibit us from experiencing the full blessings. And that fear, by the way, the fear of the uh, spirit of fear is, is the Greek word uh, delia, delia. And the fear of the Lord is phobo. So his full blessing of the fear there uh, will be not come up, Delilah, and also the lack of phobo or reverence of God will prohibit us, the fullness of his presence. And usually what causes us to be separate from God and separated from God is sin. Because we have our own way of doing things. We don't want to surrender to a God we can't see. We don't want to surrender to a God that maybe stops his eyes and believes. I mean, I get hear people praying to the universe. You know that? <laughs> I pray to the universe all the time. I go, okay, so what does that mean? Well, you know, the universe. Uh, does the universe have a name? Um, well, it's the universe. So, well, no. God has a name. His name is Jesus. Let's get it straight. And we pray to him. He hears us. He answers us. And he is there for us. So, where is it? Summary. True fear of the Lord will lead us to wisdom, okay? which will lead us to knowledge. When receive his word spoken to you and your treasure, his commandments of love and compassion, and you tune your ear and heart to understanding. And ask for understanding. Seek for it like silver, like treasure. Then you will understand the fear, the reverence, the awe of the Lord. In return, you are shielded, and you will understand true justice. I just want a couple more scriptures here. Um, Job 1. You probably know this one here. This is pretty well known. Uh, oh, sorry. 6 to 12, verses 6 to 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, oh, I wonder if he's not showing up in there, also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, well, where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, these are really important things to know, because he can only be in one place at a time. From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it, Right? He was only one place. Next, next one. Oh. Uh, no, just uh, keep going with the same verses, like verse 9. So Satan asked the Lord and said, Aha, does Job fear God for nothing? <laughs> Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. What? Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And we know afterwards he destroyed everything that he had. But he didn't curse the Lord. Right? He had reverence for the Almighty. He 
had enough reverence in him. I have to tell you quickly about um, we were watching Daystar TV uh, the other night. And a very interesting gentleman came on there. He was a pastor um, of a church somewhere in the States. And he walked outside his church um, to do something. And this gang of thugs came up with baseball bats and beat him in the head. Like, beat him like really bad. He managed to get away from him, but he ended up with severe brain damage. And he got really questionable. Like, how did, I, I, I'm a certain pastor. I, like, why would you allow something like that to happen? Right? So he went through hell in a handcart, literally, afterwards. And it took a while for him to get come to some kind of understanding. But he was he had a background in um, electronics and physics and stuff like that as well. And so he started, he determined that if he could train his brain to see in this trauma what's what's going on, then maybe he could somehow fix it, right? So he went through this whole thing and he did, he did experiments with his brain. And he found out that if you take a picture of the brain, not only a physical picture, but uh, an electromagnetic field picture of his brain, of his brain, that he could actually he discovered there was actually a front electromagnetic lobe that it has a frequency response to it. And so what he did is he developed tones, something like the tonality for it. And through the tones, he went back into his brain that back into his brain and found out that his brain was stuck like a needle on a record, stuck from the traumatic, the trauma, right? And how many people have had trauma? Yeah, everybody's had trauma, lots, right? Whatever, car accidents or what, whatever, doesn't really matter. So he retrained the brain to take a picture, as he says, to say, the brain looked at itself and said, oh, you got a problem here. So through the tones, the brain healed itself. It healed itself. And now, he's got, there's called, and you can look it up, Cirrocet. It's a whole, um, it's got clinics around uh, in the States. It's not available in Canada, because of our health care and everything. But anyway, um, we, he's got this thing going on, and there's been Hundreds of thousands of people have been had their brains you know, back into the thing. Yeah. I, I didn't want to get into this, but I just wanted to point out something really interesting that the brain, I mean, that, uh, sorry, the we are, you know, like the tonality, of the reason why worship music is so beautiful is because of the, the tonality of it. We, we sing, but the, the, what it does is the tones are singing and everything else. This is the, an actual physical thing. And I'm not going to get weird here with you, but I'm just saying that when we sing, we release power, we release the resonant frequency of the spirit, if you want to call that. So it's the spirit the body and the soul. There's a frequency tuning that happens through that. And again, I'm not going to get into some weird stuff out there, but I'm just saying that we are it's something that we should consider in the terms of looking at the fact that when Jesus returns, it says the last trump, the last trumpet, I don't mean Donald Trump, the last trumpet is, if you take a look at the original Greek word in there, it means vibration. In vibration, right? When he returns, there's going to be a, a tone. There's going to be some kind of a, a frequency, I guess, if you want to call it that. And again, I don't don't take me. I'm not going into the new age, diving into that pond at the other end, saying, "Oh, look at this over here." I'm just saying that we have to consider that we are made up of physical physicality. We are made up of soul. We're made up of spirit. And the harmonious relationship we have has a frequency. That is a relationship we have with the Lord. God is the ultimate frequency generator. 
And when we get in line, boom, 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 with the things that he has given us, that's through the scriptures, the praise, the worship, and getting before him, we will get aligned up with him in that way, that we can walk. That's why people have been given the gift of healing, the gift of different things, because he has given them the power, and he's given them the ability to be able to, through their words, line up with the word of God, frequency, soul, spirit, and body, to be able to see healing being manifested. Our prayers are tuning ourselves to his frequency. Our prayers are bringing ourselves into his, not, not the other way around. He's always here. You know, let's face it. He's not some weird and wacky God out there somewhere that you have to bow three, five times to the east or whatever. You do that. He's here right now. He's with us 24-7. But our minds have become irreverent to him. Our minds have become, um, I mean, society has become so irreverent. It denigrated humanity. It denigrated God. It denigrated people into oblivion. They denigrated whoever it may be. Because we don't understand that God absolutely loves each and every one of us. And I've said this before. The DNA in, in you that you have in your body has never, ever, ever been in the history of the world. Okay? And it never will be. How special is that? And the value of something is based upon what? The rarity of it in the natural sense. The hope, there's only one hope diamond. Okay? For example. So you are so unique. You are so special. And especially when you've found the Lord, you've, you've had, got him living in you, that's even more special. That's powerful, right? So today, let's make today the first day of the rest of our lives. You get that? Today is the first day of the rest of your life. The past is gone. You can't bring it back, unless you want to. You want to bring back all that manure? Seriously, if you want to bring it back, you go, oh, ah, ooh, yeah, that smells so good. Ooh. We don't want that. We want the freshness, the beauty of God's absolutely incredible fragrance. God has a fragrance. He has an amazing fragrance. And it's not, you know, Dove or some other kind of cologne, Chanel number no. 5 again. It is the fragrance that is inexpressible. His fragrance is in you. His fragrance shines, oozes out of your pores. When you bring Jesus into a room, the atmosphere changes. The frequency changes. The whole thing changes because you are special. You are absolutely, completely unique. And with the power that he's given us, man, we are not just unique. We are powerful. We don't walk by faith we talked about or we walk by faith not by sight right i walk by faith each step by faith to live by faith i put my trust in you amen amen so let's start thinking about revering or fearing the lord in that sense that he is an awesome incredible God that absolutely deserves your reverence. I mean, at one time, when the kings walked in, they would bow down before the, you know, some guy, right? Some person. That was the thing to do. That was the, that was the way it was. But today, somehow, we've lost that. Oh, yeah, he's just like, oh, that's just Jesus. Yeah, well, come on in. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, he's our friend. But we need to have some reverence for him. We need to come to that point that we revert, and we also need to revert one another. When we start to lift you up, whoever, each one of us up, if we raise you up, your life will be better. Right? But we don't want to do that. There's something behind us that says, oh, if I do that, then they're going to get ahead of me. Yeah, really? So what's the deal about that? 
be a thief. <laughs> it's not going to hurt, you know, ultimately in the end of things. Our humility is not based upon how humble we think we are. Our humility is based upon the action of allowing the other person to be raised up. Our humility is based upon who can raise that person up, whatever it may be. You encourage them to come step out of that realm of where they are. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is the first day. So let's start practicing the presence of God by releasing his reverence to each and every one of us. I know everybody says, oh yeah, well I know so-and-so, you know, they've got this weird and wacky idea of things. Okay, so? So what? Well, they hate me. Okay, so what? Well, I hate my boss. Okay, revere him. He's still your boss. He has an office. You were there. You're working under him. There's lots of things that we hate. There's lots of things we don't like. But really, bottom line is maybe we should start practicing his presence by lifting other people up, raising them up, raising because you got the power of the Holy. You got the whole power of the universe working working through you. You think you don't think he can't take care of you? You know you don't think he can promote you? You don't think that he can't provide for you? Change your way of thinking. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed, that means metamorpho in French, metamorpho, by the renewing of your mind. Right? So say after me, let's all rise. I want, I, we're going to do this. I, I want you to that, declare this today. Lord Jesus, say after me. Today, is the first day of the rest of my life. And I give you complete control over my life to lift you up and to lift others up so that they may grow into, into your image in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had together. If anybody wants prayer, please come on up. You know, um, honestly, that's what we're here for. Practice what we preach. <laughs> and there is also an offering. So are those just we can. Do you want to put that up in there, Rocky? If you have a e-transfer, we have offering envelopes at the door, and we need to obviously bless people, bless the church. Um, and it does, by the way, giving is better than receiving. And once we do that, we get blessed by giving. And so if you're doing an e-transfer, you can do, uh, was it 341, 345? Oh, BRC, I can never remember. BRC341 at gmail.com. Yeah. There it is right there. You can transfer that. Amen. And announcements, Friday night, it's Bible study again. So um, it's been good. We've had some really good, not just, uh, we play games. It's not an easy game. But anyway, we play games. <laughs> we find out how much we really don't know. But anyway, it's good and a good fellowship and good discussion. So 7 o'clock on Friday night, if you can make it out here in the, in the fellowship hall. There. Amen. Amen. Anybody have anything what they want to say? I mean, anybody have a word? Everybody's quiet. Great.